Joshua, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Okay, I am um, Josh. I make um, YouTube videos on my channel, Philosophy for All. Um, like a YouTuber, I like to plug myself wherever I can. I also love um, watching football, but I think it's soccer for you guys. I still believe it's football because you kick it with your foot. Um, we, I support Chelsea Football Club. I support Although I'm in Hong Kong, I've been watching every single match for the last three years at like 3 a.m. in the morning all the time. So, I mean, that's a bit crazy. I like, I love my fishing and, yeah, I'm a Christian. So that's perhaps the three biggest things about me right, right now. Cool. Uh, I am an atheist, by which I mean I believe that everything is best explained by naturalism, physicalism, and there's no need or evidence of a god. Uh, could you tell me some of the reasons you believe there are for a god? I believe today was problem of evil moral realism or something along those lines yeah i mean i i think today was mainly problem of evil and moral realism just because when um your friend um reached out to me to discuss he he said it was going to be a debate about the existence of god but i kind of said well i'll i'll, I'll have to come on the channel but because i think he sent it to like a group of other friends that i've had i was like i'm not the expert out of that group on the existence of god so i was like probably you could go find someone else who perhaps is more familiar with that field instead of myself However, when it comes to the problem of evil and moral realism, I think I'm a bit more familiar on, on those terms. So that's kind of why we're discussing problem of evil instead. Reasons why I am a Christian, I would say it's a, a few things. I do think the arguments are pretty decent, in my opinion. And, and also, I do think that I believe the, the how do you say, it, the worldview, which is provided is perhaps the most succinct one. And, and in the words of Dostoevsky, although I wouldn't go so far to say if, if Christ was apart from the truth, but I do believe that the moral standard set by um, Jesus is one which people should follow. And, and when you follow him, I think you, in some sense, become a Christian. Cool. Uh, tell me more about the problem of evil and moral realism and why you think God is better explained by those than naturalism. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say that um, the problem of evil, I like to split into three types. I, I think there's a logical problem of evil, the evidential problem of evil, and then there is, um, I would like to call the existential form of evil. And what I mean by the existential is just the sense that there's always this feeling, and I think that existential is the strongest form of evil, because I don't think it's, it's necessarily logical or philosophical in the sense that you actually, you actually have an argument for it, but it's that feeling that everyone, I, ha I think, has, both um, uh, Christian and, um, let me try and turn down the game, maybe the audio will become a bit better, but uh, I think it's, the, it's a feeling that Christians and um, non-Christians both would um, experience that uh, that there is some something in the in the world which does have, or or at least something in the world which is really saddening to see that there exists evil, and regardless of how much you try to argue against it, like assuming that there's a world with every single explanation for why evil exists and whatever, there also will be that feeling deep within you that evil is something which is horrible and you look at God and you're like, well, there has to be some problem here. And I think the best example of that would be um, Ivan Karamazov in um, The Brothers Karamazov, where he says, uh, okay, if, even if there was just one person who suffers and everyone else is having the most amazing life, I would still reject God, even if he does actually believe God exists, right? So I think that there is that existential problem of evil. And then the logical problem of evil is, in my opinion, when um, is when, how do you call it, when God and evil are two um, contradictory propositions and there is something internally inconsistent uh, within the Christian um, belief. And then after that, the evidential problem would, would just be there is, it's, there's a high chance that God and evil are inconsistent and you wouldn't believe in them. So what is the existential problem of evil? It's something like you said it was the brothers Karmov, Karmov explanation that he wouldn't believe in God even if everyone's happy or something. I don't quite follow. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say it's the idea of the rejection of God even if you knew that God might exist. So even if someone said, well, yes, God exists, you would still not become a Christian because you would just hate oh. that God, which does exist. Even gotcha. if there's, And even if you have all the arguments in front of you and a rational person would say, well, I think God is, exists and God is good. There would still be something in the back of your mind which says, just because I pity or 
feel for that one person who is suffering, I would reject all of that God and re would rather go to hell and reject my ticket to heaven. In that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I would say that if the Christian God did exist, he would probably be evil. So I definitely agree with that one based on like what the Bible says or something along those lines. Um, and so why do you think the problem of evil, any of these versions are not successful in showing God does not exist? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that if we turn to, I think it's better if we go first from the logical problem of evil to the evidential problem of evil, and then perhaps leave the existential problem of evil. I don't necessarily think there is a response to the existential problem of evil, but I do think it's just there and will always be there because, and at the end of the day, when you're, I think, interacting with these existentialist kind of thinkers or these arguments, right, they, they kind of just are there and then you kind of just choose whichever one you kind of follow. Of course, there's some reasoning and argumentation around, but I don't think, no, no, I don't think any amount of reasoning would ever stop you from looking at like a kid with cancer and say, well, hooray, I've explained kid with cancer, right? I mean, that's not really exactly how life works, really. It's human experience works. You, you get sad no matter what you do, right? But perhaps can you um, develop or um, give your formulation of the logical problem of evil so I can perhaps form a response to it? Um, sure. So I'd say that there is no logically possible world where God could not have created whatever benefits he's trying to attain without um, solving whatever problem you want to pick, child cancer, for example, so immoral actions. So my argument would be is if there is a logically possible world where we can have whatever free will or whatever benefit you want without child cancer, but God didn't choose that one, then he's necessarily immoral. There is always going to be such a logically possible world god didn't choose it therefore god is necessarily immoral mm -hmm. do you think that such um would you then believe that there is in theory a best of all possible worlds out there which god did not choose yes mm -hmm. and probably now, a variety of them mm -hmm. well perhaps we can discuss what you would view as evil first and then we could go on to the logical problem of evil because it seems to me that uh the like child cancer and, and natural evils perhaps are made mo or are mostly unstoppable in the sense that if you're walking past like a road and in a, in a mountain right and then a rock falls off the cliff and crushes you in the head I and mean, that's perhaps an example of natural evils right but then the same reason for why the rock crushes you is is from gravity and and gravity is necessary for the existence of humans right so i think in the same way i would say most, if not all, natural evils are caused by things which are not only, which are at the same time necessary for human existence, even though they are perhaps detrimental at times to human existence as well. So, well, so well no. So, like, humans exist in heaven, don't they? But in a different form, though. Because, That's fine. But so we can have humans in a different form without tornadoes, just fine. I would say that humans existing in the world is a better form of existence than them existing in heaven. And the reasons for that, because as you said so yourself, uh, you're, you're judging, I suppose you're both judging uh, the problem of evil on the basis of the Christian side, right? There is a proposition in Christianity which is inconsistent with the existence of evil. Would, would that be a correct categorization of the problem of evil? Uh, you no. Know. Um, you can do either way. I, I'm not. I'm fine with having it be an internal critique, but I, pref, my version is an external critique. So I say that, from my understanding of morality, X is morality. This is not moral, or something like that. I wouldn't say it would be an internal critique, but um, it's definitely logically possible to have humans without tornadoes. There's no logical contradiction there. It literally happens every day all over the world. Um, you don't need. For example, gravity to have humans, or you don't need gravity to be this strong. You don't need all the forces to be exactly as they are to have humans. That's granted by every physicist. There's a huge spectrum of different combinations of laws that can exist and have humans. Um, and so it is false to say that it is logically entailed to have gravity and to have humans. I would say natural. But in, in this world we live in right now, right, we could say the, the existence of humans is based on these certain laws like i mean those sure. humans might exist in a different form right if there was no gravity and whatever whatnot right? right but at least in the world we live in right now like these laws are essential for the development of humans as we exist right now right would, you, would we agree on that sure but that wouldn't be addressing the argument which is that it's logically possible to not have it that way 
but I think at the same time you would you would also say that if you're looking at the goal because it when you said the logical pro when you formulated the logical problem of evil just now and correct me if I'm wrong in saying this it was kind of you're kind of saying well in according to that logical problem of evil um, there was the world right now that we see today is inconsistent with um, the goals in which God used to create the world right or or the world was not does not reflect what God would believe to be the world he wanted to create. Is that is that kind of great? Uh, no, the, the argument is any possible benefit can be attained without any given uh, evil. We can just pick an evil, whatever you want, and say there is always a logically possible world to achieve that and all of them, whatever combination you want, without child cancer. And so mm -hmm. if there is a logically possible world to do that, and that proves that God is immoral for not creating that logically possible world instead of this one. But don't, I'm not really, well, I think it, in that sense, you would be seeming to suggest that there is a best of all possible worlds. But, but I would say that that best of all possible worlds in that sense is not necessarily the same as what the best of all possible worlds is under the, and that's why I'm saying it, it, whether it's an internal critique or external critique is a very important one. Because if you're looking at an internal critique, you could say that, well, this is the best of all possible worlds in relation to the goals which God has. Now you could say those goals are good, evil, or whatever, like bad or whatever, right? From an external side. But someone could say, well, yes, I, I don't really care about those goals. As long as Christianity is internally consistent, I don't care about whatever external factors there are, right? You could say that, but you could also say... Uh... Christianity is internally consistent if God tortured all babies eternally. Um, so having it be internally consistent is irrelevant here to the argument. The argument is more this is an evil, um, and God did it. And so it doesn't really matter if it's internally consistent. So if Hitler gassing all the Jews is internally consistent, uh, and you can say it's perfectly good, it's just it, dumb. <laughs> so whether or not it's internally consistent really doesn't matter to the problem of evil. The problem of evil is more saying here are things we agree are evil with our understanding of what evil is, moral intuition, moral progress, philosophy, whatever. And God did these things, so God is evil. And it's not based on an internal critique. And to make it into an internal critique is a more complicated argument where you have to argue that God says X is immoral in the Bible or does and does X in the Bible or something along those lines. And so it's self-contradictory. But whether something is self-contradictory uh, is a different argument than the problem of evil. The problem of evil on its own is just saying God is evil for the stuff he does. And to show God is evil, you got to show us there's a logically possible world to achieve whatever goal without any given example of evil. I'm not so necessarily the, sure what... Mm -hmm. so, so like the internal critique is a smaller subset of the problem of evil and the problem of evil doesn't need to entail that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think um, the problem with that would would be the idea that I don't think it would be very convincing or, or, or even if it doesn't really matter if it's convincing or not, I don't necessarily think that if it's not, if it's an external critique, right? There's always that problem where you're going to have to say, well, what is evil? And if that evil is not the same as God, then, well, someone who is on the Christian side could just say, well, or I, I don't really care about whatever conception of evil is, right? Do you, do you understand the concern that I have with the external critique, right? Because yeah, but that's kind that, of... I absolutely understand, but that's kind of winning the debate. So if I say uh, drowning babies is evil and you say, I don't agree with that conception of evil, then essentially everyone's going to agree with me and you lose. So if I can provide a obviously compelling example of evil where you just have to bite the bullet and say, I don't care if you count that as evil and it's something just horrendous, um, then that shows that your conception of morality is just abhorrently wrong in that context and which would then also um lend credence to my model as opposed to yours so if i say like uh those are the worms that eat out the eyes of babies um that's evil and you have to say no i don't think that's evil i think that's good that's that's a good world um then the consequence of that is that your view of good is horrendous compared to mine and if we're comparing the worlds mine would be better to the best of all possible worlds than yours and i think that's what is required in order to establish the problem of evil holds is that a different conception of a world is a better world than what the Christian conception is. Mm -hmm. 
Now, okay, so I, I think I understand a bit more about um, your argument, and that's good. I, I, I would say that perhaps when we're looking at the world we're living in today, right, I would say we are in some sense living in the best of all possible for the goals in which God has for us, which are, I think, the development of people as humans in relation to each other and also in relationship to whatever moral standard that you have, right? And, and I think that um, part of this has two ways. Right? One is free will, and also you also have to have some ability to go from what is the state of moral, perhaps not as good, to um, somewhere, some uh, state where people are morally a bit better. For example, uh, soul building theology, and that I think have give, lent quite good credence to um, the view that, well, we live in a world where we are able to improve ourselves more in a moral landscape. And I think that that is ultimately the goal of what God has for um, us. And I think that having a, a, a great extent of freedom to do so is also quite an important situation for that. Well, I'd argue that we can have all of that without any evils, without any of the... I would say every involuntary imposition of will can be... Uh, eliminated and still have all of that things you just described. Um, we obviously don't need tornadoes for that. We can do all the soul building stuff without tornadoes uh, or eye, eyeball eating worms. We don't need eyeball eating worms. Those aren't required. Child cancer. We could, we could do all of that without child cancer. Uh, so it seems whatever benefits you think are required in order to attain the good, we can do all of that without pretty much any of the evils that we see in this world. They're, they're just unnecessary. They don't accomplish anything. But would not Okay, we could turn back to the natural evil in, in a second, but don't you think that moral evils are kind of necessary for a world to be morally improved? What morally what? Improved? Like, um, moral, no, yeah. no. So you can have... In order to have moral improvement, all you need is amorality. So if everything's amoral and you add an immoral action, that's moral improvement. So you don't actually need immoral things to get moral improvement, but you can have them. So in my uh, in my example, you can have things like uh, the exact world we live in today can be one of the options. So you can choose whatever whatever principles that describe this world and just add the rule that if you consent to being here you will live here and if you don't consent to being here you won't live here so whatever benefits are added to this world are an option and what i'm describing just it's just consensual and so whatever benefits are entailed in this world even if i don't know them i can say any hypothetical benefits um they're a, attainable in my world because they're optional you can choose to live here therefore this logically proves whatever benefits exist in this world are um, attainable in my better world where it's just optional to be here, which proves there is a better world um, that was logically possible, which can attain all the possible goods in this world without one of the consequences, one of the negatives. And so in that world, you can just say, no, nah, I don't want to be here. I don't want, I don't want the rape and murder stuff. In other words, I'm going to live in a different world, in which case you don't have those, um, but it's simply your choice. And so that deductively proves whatever logical possible good there is of this world can be made better just by making it optional. Well, I'll would, I would disagree in the sense that I think if you are, I, I'm, I'll first kind of disagree with the idea that there are no completely amoral acts. I don't know, especially I think on the definition that things are in positions of the will, because I do think that almost every single act either increases your, well, it depends on what you mean by free, free will, right? under your scheme of morality it's like well like an amoral act would be like picking up a rock that would be an amoral act mm -hmm. or so sit, I, I, sitting in the chair maybe no sitting in the chair might be moral but <laughs> yes your chair seems to be has quite a cult status or something on, yes. on your youtube channel it seems yes so i do think that um there are what well, of course there are going to be a certain amount of amoral acts but i i wouldn't necessarily say that it would be good to just have a world of people just picking up rocks and and um, sitting on chairs by default, and then developing into more moral acts. I mean, would would you would you say that that's something which is good if everyone was going from picking up rocks to sitting up acts? Well, that would be moral improvement. It would be an example of moral improvement. I'm not sure whether moral imp if amoral is seen like where does amoral lie on the idea of moral improvement? I mean, are if you're counting it as the um, moral improvement as the amount of good in the world, then maybe that'll be moral improvement. 
but but then amoral acts seems to be just completely beyond the spectrum because they are amoral. Well, right. So like if you have an amoral act, there's currently zero morality in the universe. And if you start doing moral things, the amount of morality is increasing. Uh, your moral character could be increasing. Um, the goodness in the universe could be increasing. So there would definitely be a progress from amoral to moral, which moving moving you closer to the moral spectrum. So that would definitely seem like moral progress. I don't I don't think you have to start at a negative number to have progress. You can start at zero and still progress towards something. Um, so I don't I don't see why you would need immorality to have moral progress. Because I wouldn't be so sure whether amoral actions would be zero. I, I think it's like you cannot even apply numbers to amoral actions. Because I mean, for example, if someone says, I know this is quite a weird example, but if someone says, okay, there I have I'm on the gender spectrum, right? And then they say I am completely agender, they wouldn't be on the spectrum at all to start off with. I mean, whether you believe they're whatever they're arguing for or not, it's a different thing, right? But if someone says, I am completely beyond and outside the spectrum, like that is also a possibility as well. Yeah, but that only apply if you couldn't go from a gender to one of the genders. If you can make progress and go from, say, I am a gender today and then transition into being male tomorrow, well, then it's got to be on the spectrum because no, you're no longer a gender, you now are a male. And so if you are amoral today and you do moral actions and become moral tomorrow, that's clearly a transition on a scale. Uh, it wouldn't be completely divorced. For it to be completely divorced, you'd have to be able to be amoral and moral at the same time but they're mutually exclusive concepts. They, you can only be one or the other. I would say that um, becoming moral, if you do a moral act, you would fall into the scale. Instead of, instead of saying, well, you are on the scale, to start off with, you're amoral, and then you do a moral act, which puts you onto the scale. And then in that sense, you would say that once you're on the scale, then you can have that scale of, well, are, am I becoming more moral or not? Because before doing anything which is of a moral nature, you're beyond it. And then when, by getting into that moral landscape, you get onto that on that scale uh so i'm not following like to me it seems like if you've done no moral actions and you've done no immoral actions you're still on the scale you're just at zero and the word for that would just be amoral um so i don't i don't see that as not on the scale it's just you're in the middle in between moral and immoral um, and you can use whatever word you want to describe that i'm just going to use amoral and say you're on the scale so if you're at zero if everybody's at zero you're in a universe of people with just all zeros and they start to make improvement towards the moral side. They're on the scale and they're making improvement. <laughs> but perhaps you could just sidetrack this. I don't think it's really key to the central debate of, of the issue um, in the larger in the larger sense. I mean, I would just disagree by saying South Africa, but whatever, I don't. Unless you think that it's um, crucially important, we could discuss this topic. Well, more, you said it requires, mm -hmm. require moral progress is something that's important. Mm -hmm. And if yeah, you well, do mm -hmm. no moral actions, no immoral actions, you're at mm -hmm. zero and you can do moral actions. That's progress, mm -hmm. right? You've gone from zero to one moral action. Mm -hmm. Well, I think zero to one is moral progress. I'll, I'll agree with that. As, but I, don't, I, I just wouldn't say that zero is a starting point at all because, because if someone does evil, right, and then they start to do good and then they pass by that zero, are they amoral all of a sudden? Like if someone was like, I don't know, shooting people, and then after that they were improving their moral actions, right? And then they slowly get better. Like if they're going from a scale of negative 100 to like positive 100, let's say, they would be crossing zero at some point, I assume. Like at that sure. point of crossing zero, are they suddenly amoral or are they not amoral? Uh, the net outcome would be amoral so if you do 100 immoral actions and 100 moral actions the net total is amorality so the universe in a whole say you have 100 immoral actions 100 moral actions is uh neutrality it's an, essentially a universe that balances out uh which would be less than a universe that has 100 moral actions more than a universe that has 100 immoral actions but you can definitely do a comparative analysis to calculate where it would land it's not like um if it's the case that you have 100 moral actions and 100 immoral actions in one universe, and you compare that to a, a universe with 150 moral actions or something, the moral, the moral ones is better because it has 50 moral and zero immoral or something. Um, so I don't know. I don't see the relevance of the language amorality. It's just a lack of moral or immoral actions as of yet. But that word, it doesn't really make a difference. Is moral progress possible in a world with zero moral actions? Yes.
<laughs> but Go ahead. I would say that um, if you have like a hundred people, imagine like uh, killing someone is like minus a hundred, right? And like saving a kid is like plus a hundred, whatever it is, right? Whatever. And then this guy does five hundred bad stuff and like five hundred good stuff. Then his net calculus would be zero, right? But I wouldn't necessarily say someone who started off his life as killing people and then got himself to minus five thousand and then did really good things and got himself to five thousand to change his life completely to try to improve himself. And then it just gets to a net like zero. Imagine the guy dies after doing like exactly the amount of things to get back to where he is, right? I wouldn't say the person's amoral. Well, That's again, the, I, the amoral word there just makes no difference. The, the question is, is can you have moral progress without being immoral? The answer is yes. I'm going to call that amorality. Whether you mm -hmm. can transition back into it or not is like, yeah, I think you can balance it out over time. Sure, it'd be fine with me, but it doesn't matter to the argument. The argument here is just, can you start at a non, without doing any immoral things and then make progress? Yes. That's all you need for moral progress. That was the point of your argument is you can't make moral progress without being immoral. That seems wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll perhaps concede that side of the thing. I think you can improve. Though at the same time, I would also say that that was kind of like the first part of the argument. The, the second part of the argument, I think, works independently of the first one is that, is that I think people do could start from a state of immorality and do good and do evil. And, and that second potentiality to do evil is what we see today when evil is, is carried out, right? I would say people have freedom to choose to do good and evil, and as a result, a lot of evil is occurred by or comes through with that um, choice to, for people to do evil. Well, yeah, but I have that one in my universe too. So in my universe, you can choose to want to harm someone. Mm -hmm. You just can't physically harm them. So you can still choose to think evil thoughts, covet neighbors, lie, whatever. You just can't physically harm anybody else without their consent. And so you can still have the same intentions um, they just don't have the same physical consequences. So even in my case of my example of the best of all possible worlds, where it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing, you can still have all the same evil intentions as you would any other human. And so based on your definition of having evil intentions, that would be equivalent on both our, both worlds. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're comparing both worlds here. Though. We're, we're more so saying, well, why is there evil in the world? And why is the evil in the world part of God's plan, right? So, I, mean, well, your, I believe the argument was, is, is it possible to obtain any potential good without uh, a potential example of evil, child, cancer, worm, eye eating worms, tornadoes. And so if I can, if I can give a logically possible world that has all of the good stuff that you want or that you think is required for a Christian perfect world, but without any given example of evil, then I've demonstrated there is a logically better world than this one, and God can't be good. And that's so that's my goal is simply to show is there a logically possible world to get all the benefits that you listed? And you've been listed free will and moral development, I think, were the two ones, character building. Those are like the two things you listed, and we can get both of those in my world without child cancer, which seems to prove that this isn't the best of all possible worlds. This isn't a morally perfect world. I suppose the, the difference here would be, because I suppose you would attribute child cancer as a form of moral evil, right? And by my definition, yeah. Mm -hmm. But all I need to say here is that God would be evil for creating a world with child cancer versus creating a world without child cancer that has all the positives, equally as many positives. Mm -hmm. So now we're going back to kind of, we're moving away from the existence of moral evils to... Um, uh, oh, we're discussing kind of like the natural evils. Is that correct? It works for any evil. Uh, so I would say that the moral evils, which are like intentions, uh, counting a neighbor's wife or whatever, are still possible in my world. So if you want to say that there's some consequence to preventing people from having those kinds of intentionality evils, I would agree. And I'd say they can still have all the intentions. They just can't act on them. Like they can't literally punch someone in the face. So they would still have all of the evil intention things. They're capable of desiring evil, in which case the character of building is still possible. And so it doesn't, they don't need to literally be able to kill people to be able to have the character building of changing their intentions. What do you mean when you say they can't literally punch someone or attack someone? Like if I tried to punch you in the face and you didn't consent, 
my fist would pass through you like you were a ghost or something. So like you, you just, I wouldn't be able to punch you in the face unless you consented. So there's, so how is that? Is it, is it kind of like some Star Trek thing where you just kind of phase, you phase people around the place whenever they try to get punched? Or Yeah, God's all powerful. So he can make you like transverse dimensions or whatever. So you can't get punched. Sure. I mean, is that kind of the, I don't exactly see why would why would God do that though because it seems that part of moral actions is that there are consequences to them. I don't I don't necessarily think that something would be as moral if I could just shoot someone the same t- the same person like five hundred times and the guy's just like still alive. That like, you wouldn't exactly be killing people like trying to shoot someone doesn't really do anything, right? Uh, sure, but I'm not sure why that that matters here. So the point is is that you can still have moral development like Stephen Hawking has free will, right? He's paraplegic mm-hmm. or he was before he died. Um, and so he still has all the free will and the character building stuff, but he, it's literally incapable for him to punch anybody. He could never punch anybody because he can't lift mm-hmm. his arms. Um, and so he is an example of a logically possible person who exists in this world who has free will and character building, but literally can't punch anybody in the face. And so losing the ability to punch somebody in the face doesn't infringe on his moral freedom or his character building. Those are both the same, right? I would disagree. Well, I, I would disagree in the sense that I think the Stephen Hawking example, like if he did, or I mean, I, I agree that he cannot um, do those things, but if he were to actually try to shoot someone and successfully shot someone with a gun, that person would die. And that would be a result of actions having consequences. I think that that's a very um, important thing. Like the consequence of an action is important because otherwise shooting someone, if it had no impact on their life, would not necessarily be a moral evil. Like if I shot someone like 500 times and nothing happened to the guy, I wouldn't say that's evil at all. Well, so the argument here is that God created one person, Stephen Hawking, who Mm -hmm. by God's definition must still have free will and must still have uh, the ability to morally improve because that's like the minimum requirement for all beings in this world, right? All beings have that. Mm -hmm. And so... If there's one example of a being who has that but can't punch people in the face, well, then punching people in the face isn't a necessary requirement or entailment for having all of the good moral stuff that God wants in the universe. So now we can say, okay, we can apply that to all people so no one can punch anyone else in the face. They all still have moral freedom. They all still have moral improvement. They all still have the minimum requirements of whatever God needs to have a perfect world, um, moral development, free will, whatever. But you don't need to punch you in the face. Punching in the face clearly not required. So it's an extra evil that is allowed in this world that is not required to attain whatever the goods are, which shows that this is not the best of all possible world. And God picked one of the ones that is not morally perfect that they could have picked. So you picked one more immoral than he could have picked. But I would say Stephen Hawking could carry out other forms of moral evil, right? Like I think everyone has the access to different forms of moral evil. Like if you're if if a monk was in a monastery, right, he wouldn't be able to covet his neighbor's wife because all his neighbors don't have wives, right? Yes. And if Stephen yeah. Hawking and Stephen Hawking go to the bar and chat up all his neighbor's wives in like whatever university he's working at, I can't remember where he was, or was working, whatever, right? Like the and and that would be his form of way to do moral evil. So like I, I think everyone has different abilities or capabilities to do moral evils according to themselves, right? Right, and I grant that. I'm I'm happy to allow all of those things. So I all of the uh, intentional states, evils like desiring, lying, mm-hmm. whatever. Those are all fine. I, I grant all of those in my best of all possible worlds. And so I'm not eliminating all of the what Christians define as evil. I think that we can keep a lot of those things. Um, the only thing that I'm saying is that there are certain given examples of evils that are gratuitous that we we clearly don't need those there's a logically possible world where that you don't need the punching in the face don't need that can still have all the benefits without that and we know that because there are such examples in this world like stephen hawking who can't punch people in the face but still have all the freedom stuff that christianity requires for a morally significant being of some kind so in my best of all possible worlds you still have all of the psychological states. You can have whatever psychological state you want. Um, it's just physically impossible to harm people if they don't consent to allowing it. And so in that world, that's the one God, if he was moral, would have created instead of this one, a world where 
Um, it's impossible to force people to do things they don't consider doing, but you can still have all the psychological states of evil and character development and free will, and, and there's no loss of those things in this world. But wouldn't you think that um, some, if Stephen Hawking's like stole someone's wife or something like that, right? Like, wouldn't that also be have a, sim a similar impact as someone who um, punched someone in the face? And of course, it's a bit different, like your face hurts instead of like your wife cheating on you or whatever, right? But still, I would say there is um, an impact, whether it is physical or, or mental, to the persons who are involved, like the person who got yeah. cheated on or whatever. Like, I, yeah. I don't see the difference between the, the impact of what Stephen Hawking does or can do to the impact that someone who's able-bodied can do. I mean, of course, it occurs in a different form, right? But still, I would believe has like this, a similar impact. Well, in my view, I don't think uh, psychological states are immoral. So I would say that we can allow all the psychological states and I wouldn't care at all. From my view, I think that my only argument here is that can I lame one thing which we can do without but still attain all the goodness stuff? And punching in the face is a good example. We can have a world where it's, lot, where it's physically impossible to punch someone in the face, keep all of the psychological cheating and whatever, and we get a world with exactly the same amount of free will and moral development. And so uh, the argument here isn't that, because I don't want to eliminate all of the psychological states. I think they're fine. I don't think they're immoral. I think that it's only Christianity that thinks they're immoral. And so by my definition, I'm not eliminating all evils. I'm only eliminating the ones that I think are evil, which are like involuntary impositions of consent. And so in the case of cheating, if a wife uh, consents to marry a guy and under the pretense of their arrangement, they agree to allow affairs or whatever. and she consents to an affair with Stephen Hawking. That's nothing immoral has happened there. I think that's but fine. If, mm -hmm. And well, Christianity was, would be immoral. Mm -hmm. But then, if there was a situation where they, they, there, it was the marriage was under a pretense that they wouldn't cheat on each other. Would you say Stephen Hawking did something not good? Yeah, but in that case, it would probably be impossible in my world because if you agree to live together in your universe where the rules are that you physically can't cheat, then that would be one of the things that wouldn't be possible. You could still like, covet each other or imagine cheating, but they couldn't actually do it. And so in my, the way my world works is that every person gets their own universe and they get to design the rules however they want. Um, and so they can include rules like cheating is impossible or something. So any action that they don't consent to would be placed on a physically impossible list and any action they consent to is placed on a physically possible list. And then their universe, the things they don't consent to would be impossible. I would, I would say that that world isn't exactly the world in which God is intending to make, because what seems to me is like, it's being argued along the lines of, um, the, the, the best of all possible worlds is, does not allow for any evil to occur. Like physically, is that correct? Uh, unless you consent to it, yeah. Which is the point. So that's saying that because God doesn't intend to create that, God is therefore immoral. Um, because whatever the goods are, free will, character building, all of the goods can be attained in that world. And so because he didn't intend to create that world, that's what makes him immoral. I wouldn't necessarily say that that includes free will, though, in that, in that world. Why? Because I don't... That would defeat my argument, but I think we can attain free will in that world. So how would we not be able to attain free will in that world? Because part of acting freely is that the, the, the result of that free will is able to be occurred, right? If I wanted to kill someone and I killed them, but then some, suddenly I'm not able to kill them because of whatever magical force field, right? I'm not really freely able to kill the person. In, in that right. Sense. So Stephen Hawking, he intends to kill someone, but he's paraplegic, so he literally can't kill them. Does he no longer have free will? Well, in the, in the sense that he, his possible acts are limited. However, he could also do other evils, and I think that each person has their own moral struggles. Right. So I'm saying we can keep all those other evils. So everybody has other evils. Everybody is like Stephen Hawking. They have evils they can do, but it doesn't include punching people in the face and killing them. So that one's out for everybody but they still all have other evils they can do. So they still have the free will. They still have the character building. They still have all of the parts that are required in morality, but they don't have the ability to kill without consent. And so you still have free will. Just like Stephen Hawking still has free will. But then, okay, so I think 
we were kind of getting distracted by the words of killing people in, in the physical sense, right? But imagine we're all Stephen Hawking now, right? As per your argument, we could still, all, people could still cheat on each other against their conception of the will. What stops that from happening? Well, if you have, if you've designed your universe, because everybody gets a universe and you design it such that um, it can't physically occur, same thing as punching, you just become ethereal or whatever, then it wouldn't happen. But I mean, most people are probably okay with allowing open relationships at this point but if they didn't want that they would have that option because it seems very strange to say that well i mean if 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 there was no open relationship right like if everyone agreed not to have an open relationship then stephen hawking still goes around and manages to his game's amazing and manages to pull like loads of females right like in that situation like would you say like would you say that that is that still possible in your in your universe? So uh, everybody gets a universe. Stephen Hawking has his universe and he can allow whatever he wants. And the women each have their own universe and they can allow whatever they want. And you have your universe and you can allow whatever you want. Um, if you are in a relationship and uh, your partner, you want to live in a universe with your partner exclusively where you agree to all live by these rules and you don't or can't go to other universes and they consent to this, then no, it would not be possible for them to cheat on you. Um, if you live with a person who says, I want to be able to go to other universes and live by other rules. And so they're going to be able to cheat on you. You have to consent to that agreement, in which case they can go to Stephen Hawking's universe and, and cheat on you. And so if you've consented to a relationship where you're going to live exclusively in the universe, you co-design with this person that would not be possible if you agree that the person is still allowed to go to other universes, then it would be possible. I'm not sure though how that would be a, in a moral sense, the best possible world. Cause I don't think you can have that. I, I like, if you just created it, it's kind of just like if you put everyone into a virtual reality, is that kind of correct? Yeah, am I like, am I measuring? Well, that? um, virtual reality is, how is our closest parallel to here? But again, we're talking about an all-powerful God who can create infinitely many universes. So we can literally just create this with his magic powers. So it wouldn't be a counterexample to say that it's like a matrix when comparing our most closest examples in our pragmatic world. Because the point here is, can the all-powerful being create this world? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he created our universe. So yeah, this is not too much of a stretch here. I'm not disagreeing with the idea that it's possible for God to create. I think God definitely can create it. I'm not saying he can't create it. I'm just saying that even if he did create it, I don't necessarily see how that's a better world than the one we live in right now. A world where you can't murder people without their consent? Yeah, I, I would say that the world right now is better than that one because, because there are consequences to the actions and also that people have relationship with other real people. Like It's not like you're interacting with some... If I understand you correctly, you're not interacting with some your own figment of your imagination where you create whatever laws are there to which you like the most. So I'd say the world we live in today is the best because there are structures which we have to do, have to deal with, there's consequences to our actions, and as a result, we can develop based on those consequences and actions and choose whether to do good or to do evil and have actual significant implications to what we actually do. Right. So that's still true of everything in my universe, but you have to consent to it. So if I consent to being killed, you can kill me. Or if people choose to consent to live in the earth as it looks like the earth we live in exactly the same, they can do that, but they have to consent to it. So all of those things you listed are possible in my world, but everyone has to consent to it. That's the only difference here. So it doesn't make sense to say you can't do those things because you clearly can in my universe. The only difference is they're consensual. They have to be. I'll, I'll disagree that the, because I'll, I'll disagree that the fact you need consent makes the world better. In fact, I would say that um, the fact that you cannot consent is precisely what makes this world good. It's precisely the fact that actions have extreme consequences to them which makes this world even better. I think that's more important. Well, this is where I, I would make the argument that if you have to grant some horribly immoral thing is inherently moral and you have to bite the bullet on that, that's kind of the strength of the argument that you're just um, admitting that your worldview seems inherently immoral by comparison. So 
if you have to say a world where rape and murder and uh, those kinds of things are better because people can't consent and they are forced to them, that seems like you're just admitting that your conception of morality is inherently immoral. Um, and so that would just demonstrate the power of the argument from evil here, that uh, problem of evil that as from your view, God just is evil because he has to allow these things by your worldview. I'll, I'll disagree with that idea that those things are actually as bad as you say they are. And maybe to you, and from your perspective, you would seem that I'm biting the bullet. And, and you can feel free to believe that if you want, right? But I'm not, I don't view it as biting the bullet in my perspective, because I would say that a world, if all things are being equal, imagine no moral action has been occurred, right? Has occurred yet. You would say that if, if you do something and there are real consequences to what you're doing, instead of something which is, which isn't real, or, or, or at least isn't occurred, or has, how would I phrase it? Well, like, so just clarify, it, it sounded like you said, rape isn't as bad as you think it is. I think that's like, because you said- No, that's not what I'm arguing. Well, because so, I thought that's what you said. You, you, it seemed like, because my argument is, is that a world with non-consensual actions like rape is evil, it's bad. And you're saying- it seems like you're saying, no, a world with those things is not bad. It's actually better. It's better to have a world with rape. Um, and to me, that seems like biting the bullet. It to me, it seems like you're saying rape is good for something, uh, in which case the strength of the argument here would be to say that your view of morality seems to be incorrect compared to mine, it seems to be more immoral compared to mine because... Uh, you are biting the bullet on this thing that rape is actually better than non-rape. A, a universe with rape is better than a universe with not rape. Well, I'm not arguing that rape is better than non-rape. I'm just, all I'm arguing is that a universe which has the possibility of these actions are better than one in which there is no consequence to these actions. For example, if someone in your universe would say, I want to go rape someone, like, I don't Let see how... Mm -hmm. Well, so there's two things there. One is that, say we had a universe with all people who were just perfectly good and there was no rape versus a universe where they're just physically impossible to have rape. I don't see any morally significant difference between those two um, because you can't, if, if it doesn't happen, even if it's possible to happen, uh, there wouldn't be any more, like if there's a possible immoral action, but nobody does it, then there's zero immorality. And if it's impossible, there's also zero, zero immorality. And so those are functionally equivalent universes. Um, so I don't think adding the possibility makes a difference one way or the other there. Well, I'll say that the first um, world is, the, is the, the intended world which was created. Unfortunately, people just did not do good and they decided to do evil instead. So I don't think we're necessarily disagreeing on the, the first state of the universe that we're arguing for, right? Like we're not disagreeing on the on the potential of what God created. We're disagreeing about the outcomes of it. Because I would say that this world was intended such that people only did good and not evil. However, people have decided to do evil instead of good, hence rape and all these things. I'm not saying it's good that people are doing them. I'm saying it's good that actions have consequences. Right, and I'm saying that a God who creates a world where you can violate another person's consent is inherently immoral creating that world and forcing people into it without their consent is an immoral action. So just creating the world isn't immoral, but if you force people into it who haven't consented, that is an immoral action. Um, and it's also an immoral action when your consent gets violated by the rapist or whatever. Uh, but if you're saying it's good for God to force, to create this world and force people into it and force people to be subject to the consequences of this world, then you're essentially just granting that these evil actions are actually good, which is biting the bullet. I'm not saying the evil actions are good. I'm just arguing that the ability for people to to have act like consequences from their actions is a good thing. For example, if, like if you're doing something good, right? You're doing charity. It's good that the person who's receiving the charity has their life improved. In the same way that if you're doing something evil, there's an impact to that action. I'm not arguing how, against How is it uh, a good that a rapist can rape? How is that a good? It's not a good that a rapist can rape. It's a good that actions have consequences. 
th those are synonymous yeah. terms there. So because, to say that actions have consequences is to say that someone who has evil intentions is able to actualize those evil intentions, which you could say it's good that a rapist can rape. So my universe says it would be a better universe if a rapist could not rape. It will be a morally better universe. Um, actions having consequences, we can still have like, you can have consequences in your universe, that's fine. But it is impossible for a rapist to rape. That universe is a clearly more moral universe. And you have, you have to say, no, a better one is where a rapist could rape. That's a better universe. That that's a more moral universe. And that's where it seems like you're biting the bullets and you're adopting a more immoral framework. Here. That's just not good. Well, I would say that I, I suppose I'm not really, I think there's just a difference in what we consider as moral or not moral then, or at least what gives a moral quality to actions. Because I would say consequences are a very big part of what makes something a moral action. For example, if, if rape had no consequence at all, at least in the psychological state, or if you're shooting people, right? But then there was no consequence to it, right? If I got a gun and pointed at someone, pulled the trigger and nothing happened to the person, like trying to kill someone would be different as a moral quality than, than trying to kill someone in our world. And I'll, and I'll say that having <laughs> that ability to shoot someone is very, is, is a significant part of the moral action itself. And having a wide range of moral choices is precisely what allows for soul building. Because if you went to a buffet, right, and you had, and you were able to take a pill before you go to the buffet, which if you swallow it, you wouldn't see or wouldn't have a choice to choose half of the food in the buffet, you would say you were less free than if you didn't eat the pill and you could see all the food and have all those options. Well, well no, because you have the choice of taking the pill, so you wouldn't be less free, no. If you can choose to take the pill, you're equally as free as mm -hmm. if not taking the pill. How about if you were forced to take the pill? Yes, that would be immoral. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the same as the world we live in today, right? We're we're able to have a wide range of moral actions and there also are consequences. So if you choose to eat like uh, a, do a sugary donut instead of like the, I don't know, the protein bar or whatever, you're gonna get fatter. And that's part of the choice between choosing between two but, different foods. So, so I agree forcing someone to take the pill is immoral, but to me the pill in this case, or the forcing would be God doing the forcing of putting me here without my consent. So if God forces me into, a world where people can choose to, uh, I don't know, throw lettuce at me or something or broccoli or something. That's immoral. God has done an immoral action. God has forced me to be here without my consent. God has violated my consent. That is inherently immoral. God has done an immoral action here. And that would be the pill. Um, now, if I choose to take a pill and say I, uh, I lock off a some of the, the fatty foods or whatever, that's fine. Like, that's totally okay. But the forcing is the problem. The violation of consent. It seems to me like it is clearly possible to achieve a perfectly moral world with no violations of consent that have exactly the same level of character building and freedom um, without the ability to like murder people without their consent. Like that seems completely irrelevant. Like it seems like a, some kind of ad hoc criterion that Christians want to throw in um, in order to try and make it fit their concept of a God, which is clearly unnecessary. Like clearly we don't need this for anything. Like People live their entire lives. The majority of people live their entire lives without killing anybody. And they have equally as much character building. They don't, you don't need to kill people to get character building. You don't need rape to get character building. The fact that some minority of people have the option to actualize those states does nothing to benefit the amount of character building that is attained by the vast majority of people. And so having this included as some kind of a betterment criteria on this just seems completely ad hoc to just try and like, um, make the story of God try to fit the evidence when it clearly does not. But I'm not. I'm not sure whether that. I, I'm not sure whether you're understanding the art, fully understanding what I'm trying to argue here. Right? Like, I'm fine if you have your own conception of morality and you're saying it's it's bad, right? And then I'm coming from a different moral standpoint, right? Like, we're we're having two different standpoints of morality, so there's naturally going to be um, um, disagreements. Because, and that's kind of why I try to bring in the moral realism debate to just discuss, well, what is that starting point? Because understanding starting point is always going to be vital to understand, well, is this God good or evil? Or even if there is a God, is that God evil, right? So that's going to be always going to be an important part of it. However, what I'm arguing for is that, well, okay, we can put those things aside, right? 
I would say part of the moral action is that there's consequences. And that I, I think when you're saying, well, okay, just now you're, uh, you're saying things very, very long, so I, I, I missed part of it in the middle, which I just did disagree with it, but I've kind of forgotten it by now. But well, I, I suppose the main point that I was trying to make is just that I think there is going to be a difference between them being act, a conclusion or a consequence to an action and, and there being no consequences to an action. And I don't think there's an ability to say, well, okay, a world in which, I, I would say just because someone cannot do it, doesn't mean that that possibility isn't there and that it doesn't have a significance for the possibility to be there. And when you say, well, most people go around their lives without killing people, I completely agree with you, right? I mean, most of the people don't go and cheat on their husbands or wives or whatever, right? But then at the same time, they have the possibility to do it. And whether, as long as they have a possibility, that's fine. Like, I don't really care whether they, have, they <clears throat> end up doing it or not. I think this goes back to the point of agreement, which we had earlier, where, where we both said that, well, a world in which there is a possibility to do all these things, but no one does it, is, is kind of the same as a world which no one does those evil things and cannot do those evil things, right? I so mean, so like, um, are Americans more free than Australians? Depends what categories you have for being more free. Like free will, free will, God level, freedom, moral freedom, character development freedom. I mean, I think there are things which would stop or, um, or would, how do you call it, impair people's ability to be free, but I think everyone who are born in, are born into the world with a similar ability to have moral development. Right. So the fact that you don't own nuclear weapons and can't nuke mm -hmm. a country doesn't infringe your level of freedom, right? Well, yes. And the fact that Australians don't have any guns... That doesn't mean that they're less free than Americans because they have guns. The fact that they lack the freedom to shoot or nuke anybody doesn't mean that they're not free. So, so do you think if we gave every human being, let's say God gave every human being a nuclear weapon, would they be uh, more have more moral significance because they have the ability to do worse evil things? No, but I'll, I'll be arguing that everyone has their own kind of moral choices and opportunities. And, and each person has to be judged by, well, what things are on the table in front of them, right? An American might have a different moral struggle than we do. Right. So, so there are limits, attitude. like, like n not everyone has nuclear weapons, but that doesn't mm -hmm. matter. You can still have morality. You still have a perfect world, even there, though there's limits to the amount of immorality you can do, right? Yeah. So if we increase those limits, you still have character building. If we just cut down on them and say no guns in physics, and we made guns essentially synonymous with nuclear weapons, and so no one has nukes in a hypothetical world, and therefore but that doesn't that doesn't matter. It doesn't infringe their freedom or their character building in any way. We can just add guns to that list. No one has guns, and now they can't shoot anybody. No one has knives. No one has punchy fins. Punch, no one can punch. We, if we can just add things to that list. It has no impact on character building whatsoever because we know the ability to act on an intention to harm lots of people doesn't make a difference to your level of moral freedom. The fact that you have nukes doesn't give you more moral freedom, moral development than someone who doesn't have nukes. You don't need those. So the fact that your argument that you need the ability to actualize some desire of harm is inconsistent with the fact that we know most people can't actualize most desires of harm and don't. And so adding in the criterion that they must be able to do so is uh, contradictory with the data that we have about the world where they can't do it anyway, but they still have the ability to have moral development. So your physical inability to nuke people does not infringe upon your moral or your morality or your moral development. Therefore, taking away someone's physical ability to rape someone also would not infringe upon their free will or their moral development. I would argue that's a non sequitur because, because the reason why, of course, we cannot um, do, we cannot nuke someone, right? But we can still do moral things on our level. I, and on our level, we should be judged by what we can do. For example, Donald Trump, right? He, he well, when, well, when he was president, he could nuke people 
or whoever had like access to those buttons, they could nuke whatever, whoever like they needed to nuke, right? And in the same way, we have to be able to carry out um, a certain action in regards to us. The, the existence of possibilities is fine, but it just really depends on, well, where exactly we are on our level and well, what do we have to deal with or what do we have to interact with or fight against? And that's the more important thing, right? Like it's not about, well, oh, this person has to has this certain struggle or this person has some other action, right? Like have access to them. That's kind of irrelevant. Everyone has their own ability to do different things. I just don't see the difference between different levels of people <laughs> doing different things in, in relation to either people nuking people, cheating on people, or like lying to people, even if it's a really small lie. Like whatever access people have to whatever possible action, people are responsible for that and should be judged for that. Like the, the idea that, oh, some people can't have access to certain things is quite irrelevant. Well, so, okay, so there's different people with different levels of access, but they all, regardless of what level of access, they all have free will and they all have moral development, right? It doesn't matter which level of access you're at, uh, yeah. Donald Trump mm -hmm. or Stephen Hawking. Mm -hmm. So if everybody was at Stephen Hawking, they would all still have free will and they'd all still have moral development. Um, and so because you can still have all of the, the necessary goodness qualities without giving everyone a nuclear weapon, that means that since there's a diversity of these ranges that all have the same requirements to have a perfectly good universe of free will plus moral development, then it proves definitively that we don't need nukes or guns or rape to have um, free will or moral development because each individual could just be put at the level of Stephen Hawking and they're going to be graded on that level of the moral things they can do. And they don't need the ability to have nukes or guns or rape to have morally significant lives or free will. And so the point here of showing that there's a spectrum of different people with different uh, accessibility metrics um, shows that it, you don't need to give people the higher level accessibility metrics to have a morally significant universe. It's gratuitous. It's unnecessary. It's irrelevant. So I agree with you. It's irrelevant that you don't have a nuke. Um, but if we had a universe of people where no one could rape, that would also be irrelevant, just like the fact that we don't all have nukes. But I would say that um, moral development is important, but also the ability to develop science. And nukes come from the development of science, and um, guns come from the development of science as well. I, I don't see necessarily why we, sh we should somehow stop people from being able to develop with science in a free choice, in a free way they, they decide to develop in science, right? Well, I think that's, that's separate to the issue. So, like, say, say we can't use magic to kill people, right? No magic. I can't mm -hmm. Avada Kedavra you. Now, does that mean that I am not, do I not have free will or can I still have, do I still have free will? Do I still have moral development? Yeah. Okay. So we don't need the addition of magic to kill people um, in order to have free will and moral development. I can't, I don't, maybe I could like use a spell to blow up the entire universe, but I can't do it. I have a limitation and that limitation is my spectrum. And so the fact that God didn't add in this extra way to, to kill people doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. If, if I was physically incapable of killing anybody, it wouldn't matter. I could still be judged based on my spectrum of possibilities. And so whether or not something is physically possible uh, or magically possible or nukes, guns, whatever level, it makes zero difference here because the fact that we have limitations in the amount of harm we can cause uh, but still are able to have all of the benefits of what is required in a Christian perfect world of free will, moral development proves that this spectrum can extend further than where it currently is. So we can limit everybody in ways that, uh, are currently outside of our spectrum. So we could say guns would be like magic or nukes would be like magic. They're just outside of the spectrum of what we're allowed to do in our universe, but if they were, that would not infringe on our free will or moral development. Therefore, the fact that they are in this spectrum um, proves that God did things that were unnecessarily evil.
but I don't see why we should restrict people from developing these things, right? Like, whatever it is, like, if someone managed to have access to magic and develop that, then good on them, right? If someone went to, like, kind of like Dr. Strange, right? Some guy. Well, so just to clarify, I'm not saying we should do it. I'm saying that uh, it is not required to allow these things to attain the goals of free will and moral development. So in what you said are the, the requirements for a per perfect Christian world, free will and moral development, those can be achieved without... Magic, nukes, guns, rape, child cancer, etc. So um, the whole point here is, uh, is I'm saying that we can achieve, there's a logically possible world to achieve all the good stuff with none of the bad stuff and still have all the good stuff. I'll say there's more choices and a straighter depth of freedom if people are able to do more of the bad stuff as well. As well, that's, that's stuff. why I asked, would we have more freedom if I could do magic? I could Avada Kedavra and kill people, would I have more freedom? No, but like, because everyone can be like Stephen Hawking, but I'm not necessarily sure why we should stop people who are not like Stephen Hawking from developing nukes or whatever in the same way, because someone can use, um, develop like nuclear power plants with like similar technology and then develop well, it. Well, again, I'm not saying way, we right? should stop them. That's, that's not the part. That's not the part I'm arguing here. The part I'm arguing here is that God could create a world without nuclear weapons and still have nuclear power plants. There's no logical contradiction there. But he didn't. So he could have created worlds with greater amounts of limitations and still have all of the moral stuff that he needs. And so he is immoral for creating a world. Suppose God created a world with magic that can torture the Cruciatus curse. Say he added in the Cruciatus curse. Would that make the world better or worse? I say it would make the world better. Because okay, so can... remember, this is supposed to be the more well, perfect actually, world, no. remember? You can't say it's, you can't say it gets you better. No, like, I'll, I'll even, say... even if we grant that, even if we grant, let's say the world gets better with the Cruciatus curse. Well, then God still didn't create the morally perfect world. God still failed. So even you, you've presented a, a, I don't know, a Cruciatus curse argument against the existence of God because it could be better with the Cruciatus curse. Um, but that, that would go back to my initial argument that it seems like you're biting the bullet there. Like adding the Cruciatus curse does not seem to make the world a better place. Does not seem to make us more freer. Does not seem to make us more morally significant choices. Uh, and so it, it seems inconsistent that your logic is saying that the more evil we add into the world, the better it is. So the more opportunities for evil, the better it is. It doesn't seem to make sense. I'll, I'll withdraw what I said about the Cruciatus curse. I've, I think that that's an incorrect formulation of my own um, view. However, I would say that it should be seen the, as, I don't exactly see how you could create nuclear power plants without having the ability to create nuclear bombs. Because the usage of like the uranium atoms and whatever atoms are using is, is required for both of them or whatever. Or what you could change the dynamics of the strong nuclear force such that if they get compressed sufficiently, they don't uh, cause an explosive reaction. Um, so you can still have particle decay, which generates a, like, energy but doesn't explode you can have that there's no logical contradiction there but so, so back the cruciatus curse question is important here so yeah I agree. Would, if mm -hmm. god added the cruciatus curse would that change what would that change about our universe would it make it better or worse or no i difference? think it would be neutral neutral in the sense that i think that um if it was just creation of like, if it was just a creation of the Cruciatus curse, you could say it's because I don't necessarily think that the access to certain things are the most important thing, but rather that that actions have consequences is the most important thing. So you could say, well, you can increase access to more opportunities or possibilities, right? I think that that's one thing, and it, and it's different from having, you would say more well so so take the cruciatus curse example in the cruciatus curse my action of waving a wand and saying crucio has a consequence um in the case that it, someone gets tortured without the cruciatus curse that action has no consequence it just just does nothing so in the case that we've added the cruciatus curse my action now has consequences that it didn't have previously so by that definition uh my action now has consequences which is the crux of your argument here, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so that would make it better because my action now has consequences, which it didn't before. Well, I would say that's not necessarily something which is because it can be better in the in the strictest sense that you have now more opportunities for things to do. But I wouldn't necessarily say it's I think everything has to lie in a balance, right? Between between the act, the possible actions you can occur and things which are completely irrelevant. And I would say, yeah, the Cruciatus curse itself is bad. However, I I I think the main disagreement we have here is that I would say most of the things like shooting people and 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 like nuclear bombs and and those sorts are development of science, whereas the Cruciatus curse just kind of doesn't do anything in and of itself. Like adding magic doesn't have any implication on the ability for people to understand the world in in this in in the scientific discovery or inquiry, and and it doesn't. It's unnecessary for the way the world works. And it, so, of course, you would then come back and say, well, nuclear bombs just shouldn't be able to be made in that sense. And I, I yeah, they're unnecessary. They're unnecessary just, for the world. I don't know about. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just say I don't know enough about science to discuss or understand how um, a nuclear bomb could be. It seems very ad hoc to say, well, certain things just suddenly become possible and it suddenly there's going to be some random thing which stops the uranium atom, whatever atom it is, to act in a different way when it comes to a certain um, possible action, like a nuclear bomb or like a gun. Like, oh, so, so somehow dynamite when put into, or whatever chemical they have in the bullet, does, just doesn't function when it's put into a gun or in a certain way. Like, I, I don't see how that's a very good argument to say, well, okay, I, you can have all these atoms in a gun, right? But the moment, or like if it's put into a pistol or a rifle, that is somehow you cannot scientifically develop it in that way to create a, a revolver or like a machine gun. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that's like, <laughs> like perhaps you can explain how you can have certain scientific developments without other certain scientific developments. Well, there's lots of scientific developments that we have that have limitations. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, certain things, black holes are a limitation. You increase gravitational force to some degree and it becomes a black hole. There's a limit to the force. So there are certain forces that are limited. They can't go beyond some point because of its interaction with other forces. So you can add an extra force where nuclear bombs, you can have nuclear decay that don't become explosive, that don't become reactive to the point of um, a nuclear reaction. You can have physical interactions that have a force limiter where there's a different force there that'll stop the interaction from exceeding some specific rate due to it'll just break apart. Like trying to put a ice cube in a gun or whatever. If the ice cube melts because it's heated up, it won't be able to fire or something. So th this that shouldn't be like a hard issue to understand that it's logically possible for an all-powerful being to make ways to put limitations on physical forces should not be a huge challenge. It should be very easy to understand how that's possible. That's why Star Trek is a thing. Like, we can imagine Star Trek very easily. God could easily create Star Trek where we can print food or personal force fields. Like that part is, should be the easy part of the argument to understand that God could make things better. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that is a better world in in that sense because i mean what kind of definition are you using for a good and evil world like where do you get the idea that it's a it must be a in involuntary imposition of the will like where does that concept or argument come from Perhaps, i look at the I look at the evidence of moral intuition and moral progress. I try to make a principle that describes the pattern in those things. And then I, the principle seems to be that involuntary position of will is immoral. And so whether or not I present a model of moral realism in this case really doesn't make it a difference to the argument because the argument here is just to give particulars that we agree on are immoral. So even if we don't know what the foundation of morality is, if we can give one example of something we agree is immoral, like drowning babies, um, if I can show how that one example of an immoral action 
can be eliminated from the world entirely and still have all the good stuff that it, the argument holds, even without a moral realist argument. So uh, I would go so far as to say I can show examples of drowning babies, essentially evil things that we can eliminate which for all involuntary imposition of will. But whether or not I present that moral realist position wouldn't make a difference to the argument here because the argument is just like you need to give one example, one example of a moral evil that we agree upon that can be eliminated from the world and still have all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps I'll just mainly focus on like the classification of, of what you view as evil and good. Like, because I think that would perhaps be quite illuminating into understanding, well, from what perspective are you saying that, well, these things are bad? Like, what is the starting point, right? And I think that that starting point is quite vital to understand if you're just going to say, well, like if the conclusion that you're trying to reach is that God is evil, it would be quite important to know what you mean by evil. Okay, sure. So I, when looking at the <clears throat> patterns of moral intuition and moral progress, it seems like uh, as technology and intelligence increases, our scope of morality increases such that uh, any involuntary imposition of will that is unnecessary is seen as immoral in society. And so as we grow, things that we used to see as justified um, become seen as immoral, like eating animals, vegan rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, workers' rights. Any involuntary imposition of will that was at one point justified become seen as immoral once we grow in sufficient intellectual and resource capabilities. I'm not really sure whether I would agree with the idea that we're becoming more and more free, or at least we're becoming more and more attuned to these uh, involuntary impositions of will. Of course, in some sense, you could say, yes, we are, um, there's more LGBT rights, um, more gay rights, whatever, um, women's suffrage, whatever it is, right? But at the same time, I would say that in the past, we actually had perhaps more freedom to do what we wanted in the sense that nowadays there are way more ways in which social media and other forms of platforms do kind of manipulate you to create echo chambers. And I'll say that, which was not the same before. And in the past, there was quite a lazy fair society until the government, big government started popping up in like around the 18th century. Before that, you could basically do almost whatever you want. And that you're quite free in that, in that sense. I wouldn't necessarily say that we were making progress on that front. I could you give like an example of something because I'm not following like I can go to the Republican echo chamber or the liberal like book echo chamber pretty easily it's very easy to find you just go to truthsocial.com <laughs> I mean I, I agree that most people can find them if they wanted to but I think if you right now if you go um if you go on your social media platform I have people who just like everything they do in their entire feed is just all um people who are liberal and then there's people who ha have the same thing and everything they see is all on the republican side and they look at that and they're like or the more conservative side and all they do is just see that and they don't even have the thought to go onto the other side or to the what, debate what is it how does that go back to the argument that we're having less less involuntary imposition of will because i would say that they they don't have that many um choices and not only do they have not many choices they also are unable wait, to see wait, other... I thought you just agreed we do have choices. We, we could go to the echo chambers if we wanted to. I could I could go to Truth Social. So I'm not I'm not following how we have less choices, even though we could go to the, the other side. Well, I believe in principle, we have more choices. We are able to do more things. However, at the same time, they're created such... These echo chambers are developed to create or lead to a situation where people are are unaware and are not only unaware but they are also somewhat uh, attuned to that even if they see that they would not be able to think about the situation in a critical fashion because if someone if if you give someone like the same view again and again and again and they only grow up to a certain kind of concept and they're just fed that the entire time it's very easy for the person to even if it's voluntary to, I wouldn't even know if it's voluntary or not. They, they just, they're just fed the same narrative again and again and again. They wouldn't be able to be able to differentiate that narrative from anything else and say, well, okay, that might actually be wrong. In some sense, they're brainwashed. I'm not seeing how that's like an involuntary envision wheel. So being brainwashed, you can choose to be brainwashed. Most people like echo chambers. They don't like going into seeing contradictory data. It's not because... 
uh, it's an involuntary imposition of will that they're forced into echo chambers. People like echo chambers, and that's why they're selected from a capitalist system to create such things. Um, so I don't, I don't see how this is an involuntary imposition of will, because it's literally what people want. They want to echo. They want echo chambers. Do you think that echo chamber is? Do you think they want the echo chamber, or is it more so the idea that the the mode in which echo chambers are developed is the best way in which social media just functions, like the YouTube algorithm and stuff like no, that? No, people want echo chambers. Them. Like, there's uh, many, many studies in psychology about how. Given the opportunity, they, they will pay you to read an article mm -hmm. from someone you agree with or someone you disagree with. Even if they offer you like twice or three times as much money, you'll still read the one you agree with for less money. People like echo chambers. They enjoy mm -hmm. them significantly more. Um, mm -hmm. Seeing information you disagree with causes stress, psychological stress. People don't enjoy it, and so they don't like being exposed to information they disagree with. It's just a part of human nature. So it's... It's the fact that social media is adhering to human nature, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. would you, so that would be seen as something which is good that people are getting brainwashed in your view, right? Mm -hmm. It's good that people have the option to mm -hmm. be exposed be to only information that they want. So if people can choose to go into the opposite data, but if they choose not to, that's perfectly moral. If they don't want to see anything republicans have to say it's moral that they aren't forced to see anything that republicans have to say mm -hmm. okay I'll, I'll i'll i think we can leave that i, th I think i agree well i think you, your point is I, I now understand your view a bit more so that's quite good so so perhaps going back to the problem of evil side i mean i i in that sense i would say that like if is the involuntary um imposition of the will is like the, the standard I suppose in your perfect world perhaps you will have people who if they wanted to rape would be able to rape but just that the person who's getting raped is either a figment of the imagination or just not a, a person in its entirety right is that is that not kind of conscious how, is not yeah, conscious so like, yes yeah, so it'd be like a video yeah. game character or something mm -hmm. I suppose the not conscious thing is kind of like, like if someone gets like drunk, like blackout drunk. Oh, not not like conscious. is presently not conscious, but is a conscious like body. Completely like completely unconscious. Is, is, yeah, it's just a, it's a rock. It's a video game character or something that was never conscious. Okay. Yeah. So. So, so like that, it's okay to rape if they're sleeping. That's fine. That's, just, that's totally okay. Yeah. That's, that's, no, no, but then someone's gonna get a clip of this and say, "Oh, T Jump actually supports this stuff." But yep. no, but I think that. Um, I think uh, when it comes to um, that that circumstance, I suppose I mean I, I would I can see it as a different world, but I, I'm not necessarily sure whether it's better to be surrounded by unconscious people in that sense. Because I think part of of course this comes from my own framework of good, right? So that's a bit different than 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 your framework. So that's going to be naturally going to have some kind of inconsistencies, right? But but I think that relating and having relationships with conscious people and conscious agents are are like vital in are vital in the development of who we are as human beings, right? Like I mean that's kind of my what well, what it seems to be intuitive to me that the part of character building is that you're surrounded with conscious people who you have conscious I, I would say reactions to what you're doing. Well, you still have that option. So like you're not required to be just surrounded by video game characters. You can go to other people's universes and be in cooperative universes and be around other people if you want to. Um, it's just you could if you choose to just be around video game characters. So you wouldn't like lose that option. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I, I just think I, mean, I, I can see where you're coming from. I think that based on your kind of what I hear from your argument, I think what you're saying is quite consistent, internally consistent. And I, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that internal consistency of your, of your view. I just think that based on my kind of back, my arguments, I'll say, well, the, that world 
is also consistent with your conception of good. It's just not consistent with my conception of what good and evil is. That's just kind of like, I think the takeaway of this is to go, I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I would agree with that. The point of the argument isn't to say that uh, the Christianity isn't consistent. It's to say that Christianity has to bite a bullet, that there are many things that the vast majority of people agree are immoral, that Christianity has to say are moral, which leads to a cognitive dissonance with the moral view of Christianity. And it seems to um, cause people to see other views of morality to be superior. And that's kind of the goal of the, the problem of evil, to show that this is a morally superior way to view whatever morality is. I would just say that um, those, well, I, I, that's kind of just like kind of the main point. Like if, if you are, if it's an external critique of Christianity, then, then that's fine as well, right? Like I'm not kind of arguing to say, well, your external critique is incorrect. Because I think if you have your own framework of morality which is inconsistent then, or consistent, then, then good for you. And you could say, well, based on that framework, certain things are good and evil, right? But at the same time, I would just argue that, well, from my conception of good and evil, what we see is good. And, and that's kind of just what I'm defending, I suppose, in some sense. And, and like, I, I don't necessarily think it's one of those things where you go like, well, and, and, your problem, and you might agree with me on this, is just to say, well, the problem of evil internally, it might not be a, as big a problem as it is externally. But at the same time, someone, you could also perhaps say that a theist would just not really care whether it is consistent externally or not like you don't really care about what people say externally some people might just not care all oh, right so that would be a different argument if you're going for like the internal critique view of the problem of evil it would be more uh, a more specific biblical argument about things god did that are in contradiction mm -hmm. to his nature and that's uh more that one it would probably be more like a lot we like an evidential version. So the logical problem mm -hmm. is just saying uh, morality is X and God is in conflict with X. Therefore, God is logically impossible. But if you're making an internal critique one, making a logically a logical version of the problem of evil, that's an internal critique would be probably impossible. I don't I don't know if that would even be possible. But um, so the internal critique one is more of an evidential problem. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And I think that's perhaps the yeah, I think that's quite a that's a correct categorization of the situation. And like, though at the same time, I would say the logical problem of evil are there are two ways to view the logical problem of evil, I suppose. I think there's the way that you're doing it from an external critique, and there's also um, the one from an internal critique, kind of like Max, where he says, well, God exists and there's good. No, there's God and evil. And then you put those two together, there's the and there's the inconsistent triad. And I think that that's the more of an internal critique instead of the one that you're, you're posing, perhaps. Or, am I... I, yeah, I, yeah, there's I, the I, argument I, that I, if God was perfectly good, he would be incapable of creating evil. The fact that he was capable mm -hmm. of creating evil means he can't be perfectly good. So yeah, there's mm -hmm. there is that version too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a different that's different from the one that you're arguing for, right? If yeah. I understand you correctly. Mm -hmm. Yep. That that sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've been going for about an hour and a half. It was a great conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. Do you want to give any links or references where people can find out more about your work? Um, you could check me out on um, philosophy for all I do, just different philosophical content, do a bit of um, Russian um, existentialist work on my channel. I also get a few friends on to um, discuss different concepts and ideas. So that's just kind of a bit about what I do on my channel. So you can go check that out if you're interested. Cool. Thanks again for coming on. Really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.